Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. For those of you who tuned in last time, allow me to apologize for the, uh, rather strange individual who somehow hijacked the show. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but I assure you things are back to normal. Or at least as close to normal as they ever were. Anyway, on to today's review. Some of you may remember a few years ago when I reviewed a certain Hercules movie. Well, since that turned out so well, I decided today I should review a newer Hercules movie. Who are you? I am Hercules! Oh no, not that one. No, we're going to look at the Asylum's direct-to-DVD mockbuster, The Legend of Hercules. Ah, good old Asylum. As long as you're around, I will never run out of material. Released in January of 2014, a good six months before the real Hercules movie hit theaters, The Legend of Hercules stars Kellen Lutz as the titular character- Why am I still on camera? Um, this part is the voiceover. You're supposed to be playing clips. What's going on? What's that mysterious off-camera whispering voice who's obviously not really there, but I have to pretend they are for the sake of the joke? It's not an asylum movie? Huh. Okay, my apologies. Um, when I saw this movie, I just assumed it had to have come from the asylum, but uh, clearly I stand corrected. Well, I guess this day had to come sooner or later. I mean, the Asylum couldn't hold a monopoly on the mockbuster market forever, and they've been branching out anyway with their own original films like Sharknado. So, a non-Asylum mockbuster. That should be interesting, if nothing else. So, what studio did make this one? Okay, so the studio is called Summit Entertainment. W wait, what? Summit Entertainment isn't a tiny, independent studio. I mean, sure, they're not huge like, say, Warner Brothers or Disney, but they're a subsidiary of Lionsgate. The same people who made The Hurt Locker, which won Best Picture a few years ago. Okay, it's also the same studio that gave us Twilight and Never Back Down, but still, I would not expect them to stoop to making direct-to-DVD mockbusters. <laughs> You want to run that by me again? What? This got a theatrical release. This piece of sh- Okay, okay you know, fuck this. Okay, we're gonna skip my introduction altogether because clearly it's all wrong anyway, and we're just gonna dive right in. Because you need to see you need to see exactly what we are dealing with here so you can understand just why I thought this came from the asylum. Just, just watch. Roll it. So we start with an underwater opening credit sequence that I swear I've seen in another film based on Greek mythology. I'm Percy Jackson, son of Poseidon, god of the sea. The camera eventually surfaces in the middle of one of the cheapest looking epic battle sequences I have ever seen. The Battle of Pelennor Fields, this ain't. Did you catch that? There was actually a cut there. I'm pointing it out just because I'm not sure how many of you actually noticed it. And don't feel bad if you didn't. The two parts of that scene blend together so well. It's, it's very subtle. You know what? There's another cut coming up in a few seconds. See if you can spot this one. Look very carefully now. Did you get it? It's okay, I don't blame you if you missed that one too. They are very tough to spot. They're just so seamless. Okay, you have one more chance. Pay super close attention and you might catch this one. Don't blink. Oh man, that is amazing editing, isn't it? I think you'd have to watch it in slow motion. There's just no other way to spot that one. Anyway, I suppose I should tell you what's actually going on in this battle. King Amphitryon of Tyrans, played by Scott Atkins, has invaded the kingdom of Argos because... I guess it seemed like a good idea at the time. 
And as the two armies meet in the middle of the city, Amphitryon decides enough men have died today and challenges the King of Argos to single combat to end the war. Winner takes all. The King of Argos responds, or at least his voice actor does. King Amphitryon, I accept your challenge. Prepare to die. So the two kings meet in single combat and... Really? We're doing the random slow motion thing, are we? That's just wonderful. Anyway, the King of Argos is clearly outmatched as Amphitryon actually tosses his sword aside and still defeats him, taking a page out of The Undertaker's playbook and choke slamming him straight to hell! Like a boss. And with one quick blow of his sword... Wait. That just knocked his helmet off? How the hell does that work? You know, I'm thinking that was supposed to be a decapitation, but one of three things happened. A, they just forgot to add the effect. B, they ran out of money and couldn't add the effect. Or C, they were going to add the effect, but then the studio mandated a PG-13 rating. I'm gonna go with C, because I'd like to think the people who made this movie had some level of competence. Dear God, I'd like to think that. That night, Amphitryon returns to Camp Victorious, but his wife, Queen Alcmini, played by Roxanne McKee, doesn't seem too pleased with her husband's exploits of late. Chiron told me you took Egypt because they attacked our ships. That's right. But Argos, our neighbor, they presented no threat. You know, I confess I don't know a whole lot about the mythology behind Amphitryon, but I don't remember anything about him being a ruthless tyrant bent on world domination. And that's not the only liberty the writers of this film have taken with the source material. After Alcmini storms out of Amphitryon's tent in disgust, she returns to her own tent where we see her in the company of her son Iphicles and her tutor Chiron. Oh, where do I begin? First of all, Chiron is apparently human in this movie, and not a centaur. Even Percy Jackson got that right. Second, if you aren't aware, Alcmini is the mother of Hercules. Or Heracles, rather. Yeah, this is another movie that mixes up the Roman and Greek names. And while Alcmini did have another son named Iphicles, he was not already a toddler before his half-brother was born. He and Hercules were born as twins, as Amphitryon and Zeus impregnated Alcmini at the same time. I'm not making that up. Greek mythology is weird. Also, and this isn't so much a source material issue as a what the fuck is wrong with you issue, why would the king bring his wife and young son to the battlefield with him? Wouldn't it be much safer to leave them behind at home? That's just stupid. So many problems and we're only five minutes in. Zeus save us all. Alcmini travels to a nearby holy site to pray to Hera, begging the goddess to bring peace to her people. Not sure why she's asking this of the goddess of marriage, but in any case, Hera decides to answer Alcmini's prayer in person by temporarily taking over the body of this priestess. Queen Alcmini, approach. What do you mean, approach? She's right in front of you. If she approaches any further, you're gonna bump heads. Hera informs Alcmini that the great god Zeus has chosen her to be the mother of his son and it is this son who shall be the savior of her people and bring peace to the land. And he shall be called Jesus. I mean Hercules. Would you have his mortal son to quell your sorrow and bring peace to this land? For the sake of peace, I would. Then for the sake of peace, I shall permit it. So in this version of the story, Hera knows about her husband's plan to hook up with Alcmini and put a baby in her, and she is okay with this. Wrong! Sure enough, while Alcmini lies in bed that night, an invisible force visits her and gives her some holy lovin'. Amphitryon stumbles into the tent just as Invisible Zeus is finishing the deed and starts swinging his sword at nothing in particular, which accomplishes nothing apart from cutting down this random woman. And sure enough, about nine months later, Alcmini gives birth to a son. His name will be Alcides, and he will never be an equal to his older brother. Uh, technically, that would be true. Hercules. Your name shall be Hercules. Mom, that's the Roman name. 
Fast forward 20 years and we meet our grown-up and spray-tanned Hercules, or Alcides rather, played by Kellen Lutz. He looks a little familiar. Where have I seen- Oh, God damn it! Spray Tan Hercules is enjoying a horseback ride with his girlfriend, Princess Hebe of Crete. Yes, in this version of the story, Hebe is a human, not a goddess. I get the feeling the writers looked through a book on Greek mythology and just picked out some names that sounded cool without bothering to read any of the stories. God damn it, it's just a horse jumping over a log. Why does that warrant slow-mo, Mr. Director? Speaking of which, who did direct this anyway? Rennie Harlan? Wait a minute. The same Rennie Harlan that did Cutthroat Island? <laughs> That's right, you bastard. Now you too will know the endless pain and suffering that is a Rennie Harlan film. <laughs> Didn't I change the locks? How did you get back in here? And where'd you get that rum? Um, yes. Your roommate left the door open, and... Nope. That shelf over there. You mean that shelf which used to have a bottle of Captain Morgan that has now mysteriously disappeared? That's the one. They decide to go for a swim after their ride, but their fun is cut short when Spray Tan Hercules' brother Iphicles, played by Liam Garrigan, tracks them down when he notices the log their horses jumped over. And that mark on the log certainly couldn't have been made by any other horse ever. In any case, he finds Herc and Hebe looking just a bit jealous at the fun they're having, and he brings them back to the princess's guards. Hebe is escorted back to the palace, but Iphicles and Herc head back by a different route because... Uh... Reasons. As they head back, the scene suddenly turns into an obvious day for night shot as they are attacked by the Nemean lion. There's a weird continuity issue here as Iphicles, while standing to Herc's right, gets bitch slapped by the lion and goes down. But a second later, he's suddenly back up and on Herc's left. So either he's a teleporter, or the director wasn't paying attention. You make the call. Similar to the myth, their weapons are useless against the lion, but Herc uses his immense strength to strangle the beast to death. They return to the castle with Iphicles proudly proclaiming he was the one who slew the Nemean lion. Because that totally happened in the myth. And at this time, King Amphitryon announces an alliance has been made between Tyrans and Crete, which will be sealed by the marriage of Princess Hebe and Prince Iphicles four moons from now. Hebe isn't too happy about this announcement and runs off. Hercules quickly follows and catches up to her on a fog-covered road in front of a matte painting. It's amazing just how cheap some of these shots look. How much money did this movie cost anyway? 70... Uh, the fuck? Are you sure you didn't add an extra zero in there? 70 million? Some of these shots look like they come from a sci-fi original movie. How could it possibly have cost that much? How much money did you have to spend on spray tanning Kellen Lutz to get up to 70 million dollars? Anyway, Herc and Hebe decide to run away together, but as the sun rises, they find themselves being chased by the king's men. If we can make it across the river to Taiga, the king's men won't follow us. Why? If you can cross the river, surely they can manage it. During the chase, Hebe ends up falling into the river and Herc has to jump in to save her. Even though the water isn't flowing that fast and she could pretty easily swim to shore. And we had an earlier scene establishing she does know how to swim, so what the hell? The pair do make it to shore, but are immediately surrounded by Iphicles and his troops and taken back to Terrans. Herc is brought before the king, who informs him that he will be sent with a squadron of soldiers to Heliopolis to quell a rebellion. The leader of this squadron, Sotiris, played by Liam McIntyre, was originally promised 160 men, but the king cut his numbers in half, no doubt in the hopes that Herc would not survive the journey. As Herc and Queen Alcmene are saying their goodbyes, she accidentally lets slip her son's real name and comes clean about his divine parentage. But of course, Herc assumes his mother is crazy and doesn't believe a word of it. Fast forward a bit, and the troops arrive in Heliopolis. Sotiris sends some scouts ahead to make sure the passage is clear, but when they don't return, he takes 20 men and goes to search for them. I have been waiting so long to do that joke.
They immediately head back the way they came and find the rest of the soldiers have recently been slaughtered. Well, that's one way to avoid having to green screen an extra 60 troops into the battle. And thanks to the power of the PG-13 rating, all of these men were somehow killed without spilling one drop of blood. Praise be to Zeus, it's a miracle! The 20 remaining men soon find themselves surrounded by the Egyptians and put up a pretty good fight, Herc especially when he takes two arrows to the chest and just keeps on fighting. And while this battle isn't particularly well shot or choreographed, it doesn't feature copious amounts of slow-mo like you'd expect. Well, Rennie, you did one thing right, good for you. Eventually, the numbers prove to be too much for the Greeks, and soon Hercules and Sotiris are the only two left. The Egyptian commander Tarek orders his men to take them alive, and his archers respond by firing at them. Which seems like a great way to not take them alive. Fortunately, their aim is bad. One of Tarek's troops finds the helmet of Prince Alcides, which Herc lost in the battle. Tarek asks them where the prince lies, and Sotiris deceives him by claiming one of his other troops is Alcides. Rather than kill them, Tarek decides he will sell the two men into slavery. Who are you, soldier? Hercules. That's the Roman name! Hercules and Sotiris are sold to a man named Lucius, who apparently uses his slaves for mud wrestling death matches. No, really, that's what they do. Oddly enough, it's not the only movie I've seen this year that featured men trying to kill each other in a giant pool of mud. And quite frankly, The Raid 2 did it better. Oh good, the pointless slow motion is back. I missed it. Sotiris and Hercules are both victorious in their matches and live to fight another day. Meanwhile, back in Tyrans, Alcmene asks her husband to join her in a prayer to Hera, asking for her blessing on the marriage of Ithacles and Hebe. Now that's a prayer to Hera that actually makes sense. By now, word has reached Tyrans that Alcides is dead, and the queen asks Amphitryon how her son died. In return, the king asks how he was sired, and Alcmene admits Amphitryon is not the father. Then she pulls a knife on him, which he easily deflects. Probably not a wise move, your highness. Yes! Zeus came to my bed and blasted his seed in me to spawn a son to end your tyranny. And now, you have murdered the son of the god of gods, and you are doomed. You are doomed. All things considered, Amphitryon takes the news surprisingly well. <laughs> You're doomed. I gotta sing the doom song now. Doom, 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 doom. Meanwhile, back in the mud pits, Sotiris and Hercules start concocting a plan to get out of this hellhole and tell Lucius he should take his act to Greece, where the real fighting and, more importantly, the real wagering is. And the biggest event of all pits two slaves against six undefeated warriors, and if the slaves can somehow win the fight, they win their freedom. Seeing the monetary potential, Lucius agrees to book a fight in Sicily, pinning Sotiris and Hercules against two of his craziest and ugliest fighters. Half-Face, who looks like a Two-Face cosplay gone wrong, and Humbaba, who looks like White Coolio. The winners of this match will go on to Greece. The fight goes about like you would expect. No blood, lots of slow motion, the occasional wire jump of doom, and when not Two-Face and White Coolio are thrown into the pit of spikes below, the camera cuts away just as they land. Ooh, that's unfortunate. I'm afraid the Sicilian crowds don't take kindly to PG-13 deaths. Herc and Sotiris emerge from the battle victorious, but Sotiris is wounded and won't be able to fight in Greece. Lucius is about to call off the agreement, but Herc says he will fight the six champions alone if he has to. Lucius points out how incredibly stupid this is, but figures if Herc wants to waste his life, that's his problem. So off to Greece they go. And the fight is more of the same. More ridiculous slow motion, more wire jumps of doom, no blood whatsoever, and Hercules emerges triumphant with hardly a scratch on him. This is just getting boring at this point. After the fight, Hercules meets up with Sotiris and Chiron to start planning their revolt against King Amphitryon. Sotiris informs him there has been great distrust in the army since he was sent to his apparent death in Egypt, and the troops will gladly follow Hercules if asked. Hercules spends the next few... Days, weeks, something, whatever, roaming the lands and causing trouble for the soldiers still loyal to the king. He's also briefly reunited with Hebe, which would be very sweet if I cared. Meanwhile, back at the castle, we learn the Egyptians were working for King Amphitryon the whole time. Shocking, right? 
The king is not too happy that Sotiris and the man called Hercules have returned to Greece alive when his orders were to kill every last man. But Tarek assures him he will correct this mistake. It doesn't take him long to track down Herc, and Iphicles is rather surprised to find his half-brother alive. Herc is chained up in the town square and whipped mercilessly while the people look on, looking terribly disinterested. His fellow traitors are brought forth and the king orders Iphicles to kill them. He gives Chiron a PG-13 stab and the old man dies. As he's about to do the same to Sotiris, Hercules looks to the sky and, finally recognizing his divine parentage, asks his father Zeus for help. Now before we go any further, have any of you seen the old Hercules movie from 1958? You know, the old Italian film with the really bad dubbing starring bodybuilder Steve Reeves as Hercules? Well, there's a scene at the end of that movie where Hercules, after having just broken out of prison, takes the chain strapped to his arms and wraps them around pillars at the entrance to the palace. Then, using his incredible strength, he pulls the pillars down, collapsing the portico on his enemies. You want to see the bastardized version of that scene? Of course you don't, but I'm going to show you anyway. Zeus hears his son's prayer and grants him the strength he needs to defend himself and his friends, and instead of tearing the pillars down, he just... tears off small chunks of them. In slow motion, of course. And he proceeds to swing them around at his foes. In slow motion, of course. I would just like to point out that Rennie Harlan has been making movies for over 30 years. You'd never know it by watching this shit. And the damnedest thing is... This was filmed in 3D. I have no idea why they thought that was a good idea. Shitty effects in 3D are still shitty effects. All you're doing is making more expensive shitty effects. And I think I just figured out why this movie was more expensive than it looks. So Herc beats the crap out of the soldiers while the king and his idiot son make a hasty retreat. And with that, Hercules and Sotiris gather their allies and march on the palace. Much like the first scene with Amphitryon and the King of Argos, Hercules challenges the king to single combat. Winner takes all. But the tyrant king tells him to get stuffed. The king's men are about to slaughter Herc and his troops, but suddenly a bolt of lightning strikes Hercules' sword and... Oh, for the love of Zeus, what is this? His sword turns into a lightning whip now? Hacks! I call hacks! After Herc dispatches most of the bad guys, his troops take on the leftovers while he goes after the king. Have you come to bring the wrath of Zeus upon me, boy? Is it me, or did he just turn into a southerner? Have you come to bring the wrath of Zeus upon me, boy? I come to you as a mortal. To bring the wrath of Alcides upon the tyrants who killed my mother. Come at me, boy! No, 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 no. It's bro, not boy. Bro. Come at me, bro. You sound like a damn fool when you say it wrong. And you know the drill by now. Another fight with random bits of slow motion. And I guess the lightning whip ran out of juice or something. I don't know. And Amphitryon cuts off his cloak and... Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. I just noticed this. Isn't that cloak a lion skin? Is that supposed to be the skin of the Nemean lion? Yeah, Hercules wore it in the myth, but in this movie, Iphicles claimed he slew the lion and kept the skin for himself. So, how the fuck did Spray Tan Boy get it back? Amphitryon puts up a pretty good fight, far better than he should against a fucking demigod, but Hercules eventually gets the upper hand. But before he can kill the tyrant, Iphicles comes out of the shadows holding Hebe hostage. He threatens to kill her, playing the good old-fashioned if I can't have her, no one can card, but before Herc can save her, Hebe takes matters into her own hands. We shall be together, my love. Man, one movie ruined that line for everyone. And so the fight is briefly back on, not briefly enough, and with one last wire jump of doom, Hercules stabs the ground? So he's not going to kill him? Oh wait, no. Then he pulls out a dagger and kills the king with that because... I... uh... uh... what? 
So was killing him with the sword going to give them an R rating, but killing him with the dagger was still PG-13? It's the only thing I can think of. I mean, it still doesn't make any sense, but then again, for the MPAA, that's par for the course. With the Tyrant King defeated, Hercules runs over to comfort his dying princess in her final moments in this life. Then we fast forward to some amount of time later, where it appears a baby has just been born, and... Oh, you have got to be yanking my chain! She survived?! She stabbed herself clean through, and she survived. Bullshit! Oh, that's it. Fuck The Legend of Hercules and all of its holes with Poseidon's trident. This movie sucks! Admittedly, it's not the worst Hercules movie I've ever seen. Hercules in New York still holds that title, but at least Hercules in New York gave me a few laughs. The Legend of Hercules is just sad. The acting is mediocre at best, the direction is terrible, the writing was incompetent, the special effects were barely above direct-to-DVD quality, and the PG-13 rating made the fight scenes look like a fucking joke. And I'm sure the studio wanted a PG-13 in order to maximize the potential audience for this movie. And how did that work out, by the way? Oh dear god, what an unexpected turn of events. Someone get me my fainting couch. Yeah, they really should have gone for an R rating. The movie still would have sucked, but at least the fight scenes wouldn't have looked so obviously neutered. And speaking further on the writing, I mentioned earlier that this movie paid almost no attention to the source material. Let me clarify one thing. I'm not suggesting that not following the source material automatically equals bad writing. You're allowed to stray from the source material as long as you can come up with your own unique and interesting take on the original story. But nothing about The Legend of Hercules is particularly unique or interesting. We have a child conceived by a god and born of a woman who is prophesied to bring peace to the world. We have a man fighting for the love of a woman who is already betrothed to another man. We have a man fighting for freedom as a gladiator. We have an outlaw fighting to overthrow a tyrant king. This movie's screenplay was cobbled together entirely from stories that have already been told, and told much better. Now before we call it a day, since Legend of Hercules was almost certainly a blatant cash grab trying to ride the coattails of the Dwayne Johnson vehicle that came out a few months later, I'm sure many of you would like to know my thoughts on that Hercules movie. Well, let me tell you exactly what I thought about Hercules starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It was okay. That movie was based on the graphic novel Hercules the Thracian Wars and takes a slightly more realistic approach to the character, which is a bit disappointing as that's generally not what I expect from a story about the mythical hero, especially when the legendary Twelve Labors are featured so prominently in the trailer. But in the end, it was enjoyable for what it was. A big dumb action movie with the rock busting heads. Johnson certainly was a better Hercules than Kellen Lutz, John Hurt was a much better villain than Scott Adkins, that film had better writing, better acting, better directing, better effects. Better. Better? <laughs> just, just better. If you haven't seen it and you're a fan of big dumb action movies, I definitely give Hercules a rental when it hits DVD. I cannot say the same for The Legend of Hercules. It's not worth a rental, it's not worth watching on cable, it's not even worth pirating. There is nothing redeemable about this movie, avoid at all costs. And that about wraps it up. Next time, we're gonna be in the month of October, so perhaps we should look at something spooky. Or trying to be at any rate. Until then, I'm the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Have you come to bring the wrath of Zeus upon me, boy?